Hey everyone, welcome to season two of Reversing Climate Change. We are doing that podcast thing now and launching a Patreon. You can find it at patreon.com slash Nori Podcasts. There are various tiers with different types of goodies available. Do you want to receive a special newsletter digest of what Nori Knots are reading that week? Be a part of a Nori book club? Get special access to Nori events? Go take a look at patreon.com slash Nori Podcast for what we're offering. And in that spirit of being lean in that startup kind of way that, you know, we like to do, this list of goodies is subject to change and we'd very much like your feedback. Is there something that you'd really like to see but it isn't listed here? Honest feedback does a lot to help us shape what we offer to you. You can send an email to podcast.nori.com or fill out our podcast survey anonymously in our newsletter, which you can find at nori.com slash subscribe. And thank you so much for listening to another season of Reversing Climate Change. Hello and welcome to the Reversing Climate Change podcast. I'm Ross Kenyon. Today's a bonus episode. We have an alumnus of Reversing Climate Change back on, Dr. David Grinspoon, astrobiologist, author of Earth in Human Hands and Chasing New Horizons, on which he is the, the co-author. Also a senior scientist at the Planetary Science Institute. Also some cool stuff going on with NASA. David, thanks for coming back. Oh, well, thanks for having me. Always a pleasure to talk with you. Indeed, we are big fans of Earth and Human Hands. It's made a big impression on us at Nori. We actually have a Patreon right now at Nori, as podcasts like to do. And one of the things that we've been doing for patrons who have been uh, pledging $10 a month or more is a book club. So every month we read a book. Uh, you get together with people who also like the podcast. We've been trying to get the authors of these books to come and hang out and answer some questions and do some dialogue with us, which has been great. And David was the first author to do so in March. David, that was so much fun, and I'm really grateful that you came out for that. Oh, it was fun. I always uh, enjoy uh, talking with people who uh, share share my interests. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it must be fun to just walk into a, a crowd like that who have been already hanging out in your brain for a while and then them just, just flattering you by engaging with your intellect. <laughs> that's <laughs> well, that's, that's one way to put it. I mean, it is really fun because, you know, writing a book is a very solitary activity and you kind of can go a little bit stir crazy and you're sort of so much in your own brain. And then you put the book out and all, it switches to this very social activity where all of a sudden you're communicating in all these different ways with people that have read your book or are interested. So yeah, it is really fun to talk to people who've read the book and want to explore further. Indeed. Yeah. I, I can't imagine what that's like. It sounds lovely. Well, I guess when people listen to the podcast, they've listened to dozens of hours of us yakking and then already know all the things that I, I have said will ever say, because you're just repeating yourself over and over on a podcast sometimes, it seems. So maybe I have a little tiny taste of that. Um, but yeah, if you want to participate, you can go to patreon.com slash Nori podcast, plural podcast with an S. Uh, come join us there at the $10 level or more. And this month, we've been reading The Wizard and the Prophet by Charles C. Mann, also the author of 1491 and 1493, trying to see if maybe he'll come by for this. So it won't always be like it is with David, where he just pops in and makes it happen. But it is something that we're trying to do. So if this interests you and you want to come hang out with us, you totally should. It's been a lot of fun so far. Okay, well, we should get down to business here, David. And I'll only divert us for one brief little question here, which is that you have cool stuff going on with NASA. It's too cool for me not to bring up. So what exactly is happening with you over there? One of my uh, other interests, in addition to Earth, which if I had to pick, Earth is my favorite planet, but probably my second favorite planet is is Venus, which I've been uh, studying uh, my whole career. And in fact, my first research project as an undergraduate student was, was on the planet Venus. Uh, and it's fascinating to me because it's almost an alternate Earth, a similar planet in some ways that's evolved in this very different direction. And I'm part of a team that's uh, proposed a new spacecraft mission to Venus, proposed to NASA to fly a new mission to Venus. And this is something we've been trying to do for a long time. And uh, it's very hard to get a mission flown. It's very competitive. There are other people proposing other really good missions. But in the last round of competition uh, for what NASA calls discovery mission, which are the kind of relatively low cost planetary missions, which means, you know, under a billion dollars. So not that <laughs> low cost, but that our, our mission, uh, which is called Da Vinci Plus, was uh, selected as one of four finalists. 
which means that uh, we now have a year to develop the concept further, and then NASA is going to pick two of these four missions to actually fly. So our uh, our Venus mission has a real shot now at being selected, although it's obviously uh, still a competition. So we're it's very exciting to be sort of in the playoffs, in the finals, I guess. <laughs> and uh, now we're working really hard to try to uh, be be the mission that actually gets gets flown because we want to go back to Venus and uh, answer some of the the outstanding questions that we still have about uh, how that planet evolved and what makes it tick and why the climate is so different from uh, the, the climate on Earth. That's fascinating. Best of luck. Although I have to say, Da Vinci Plus, you would have thought you would have learned from Bodie McBoatface in <laughs> the UK and gone for like Lando Calrissian and just gone for the Cloud City illusion. What's uh, you wrong know, with you, David? You know, yeah. um, I'll, I'll take that in under advisement. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Take my stupid comment under advisement. Good to, good to know. Well, I'm sure our audience wishes you well. Venus is super interesting too. I remember um, one of the things we talked about when you were first on is how much the study of Venus actually led to us looking back on Earth and saying, wow, actually these feedback loops can lead to some serious planetary changes if they run away. And this could happen to Earth too, although we're not nearly in such extremists now. But that's my understanding, right? Venus had a big impact on how we think about Earth. Yeah, there's a, there's a long history of uh, insights we've gained about our home planet only from going and looking at other planets and realizing things that are unique about Earth or, or sometimes not so unique. And certainly um, the whole modeling of carbon dioxide greenhouses and, you know, there are other things about the, the um, way the radiation is uh, scattered in clouds that really affects climate. Things you sort of see a really different example of these physical phenomena and you realize that you haven't been thinking about it in a, in a complete way. And it helps uh, then us come back and do a better job with our the Earth models. And, and certainly Venus is... Um, you know, it's it's a very different planet in some ways, but it has these complex geochemical cycles as Earth does. And you realize that it's not unique to our planet, some of the, these phenomena and, and getting this this wider perspective on it that we, that we gain when we try to apply the same kinds of models, but really get them to fit a completely different data set from from another planet. You have have all these eureka moments that that add up to a just a better understanding of, of how planets work, and, and including our own planet. Yeah, that's fantastic. I, I'm very much looking forward to what might be learned from that. Well, okay, this bonus episode, my intention here, I'm going to set some goals. Maybe we can try and achieve it. But we had Peter Brannon on a while back, and our objective was to explain what the Anthropocene is and how is it conceptualized, what are broadly some of the debates about it, but I think Peter and I felt like, one, I think I needed a whiteboard to sketch out exactly like how big these units of time are and how geologists and people who are working on deep time, planetary scientists, et cetera. It's one, deep time is just hard to wrap your head around in general. And I think a visual is useful. But since we don't have that, I would love for people to walk away from this podcast being able to understand uh, what is an eon, what's an era, what's an epoch, uh, what might be an age, what is the yeah, uh, Anthropocene. And then you also have this concept called the Sapiozoic that is an eon. So the Anthropocene is typically conceptualized as an epic. Uh, Sapiozoic is an eon. What is the relationship between these? How should we be thinking about the geological moment that comes after the Holocene, which is what uh, we, we had left, which is prior to the Anthropocene or the Sapiozoic? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a great way to frame the question. And it is sort of hard to do without a visual and, you know, I, I would encourage people who are listening a lot. I mean, you can just literally go and Google geological time scale, click on the first thing that comes up and you'll see something. I mean, anybody who's been in a science classroom has seen something like this, these, this, this graphic with these different columns split into different units of time. But it is great to unpack that and try to uh, try to wrap our heads around what we're really talking about. I mean, another visual just to picture is, you know, think of a place like the Grand Canyon, where you're looking at all these layers of rock, and without even knowing the details of what they're all called, and, you know, the details of what we know about how old they are, just picture the, you know, the strata, the layers in the earth, and obviously the ones on top are more recent, they've been laid down on top 
of the alder layers. And as you go down deeper into the earth, you get to alder times. Now, of course, it's much more complicated than that because it depends on where you are and there's been uplift and other things have happened. But basically, when you look at one of these geologic time scales, the layers on the top are the more recent time scales and they represent, you know, geologic events and in fact rocks in the column that are made more recently and the layers down lower represent older times in earth history. And then of course we we break it up into these different, you know, just like in in um timekeeping in our lives, you have seconds and minutes and hours and days and weeks and years, you know, decades. Uh, it's sort of something similar, although they're not not quite as regular. But that we have the you know the giant slices of time, which on the we usually represent on the left of that graph, which we call eons, which are the you know the really huge. There's only been five of them in Earth history, um, and then there's eras and periods and epochs. And I I don't think we should torture the um, the listener with trying to memorize what each of those things are. But the thing to know is that as you go over to the right of that graph and you get over towards the epochs, those are the relatively smaller units of time that we break things up into. So epochs tend to last millions of years, maybe a few millions of years. Whereas when we get over to eons on the left part of the scale, the, the really giant units of time, those last for billions of years. Great. I think that is a very nice amount of groundwork that we've laid it out. And so you're talking about eons and this concept that you've either originated or been popularizing the sapiozoic. That's an eon. So this is a gigantic unit of earth history that you're proposing that we are now entering on a geological planetary scale. But most people, when they're talking about uh, Anthropocene, that's uh, that's an epoch, and that's really one of the smaller units. So you think it's you think actually people aren't thinking about it big enough, perhaps? Yeah, let me let me explain that. So the Anthropocene is proposed as a new epoch, and the epochs are you know again over on the right side, um, the relatively small relatively small units of time, which is funny because for us in human time they still seem unbelievably unimaginably huge because they you know they can be millions of years long, but the uh, supposedly, until the idea of the Anthropocene, the time that we're now living in had been called the Holocene. And the Holocene, it, we pretty much agree on the beginning of the Holocene, it was more or less the end of the last deep ice age. So it, it's something like um, 12,000 years ago, which sort of almost corresponds to the beginning of, you know, human recorded history. You know, it's a little bit further back, but it's it's really, in a way, the Holocene, the, the entire time we've been sort of building human civilizations and towns and cities and, you know, stop being hunter-gatherers and have been, in a loose sense, constructing human civilization has been in the Holocene in the last 12,000 years. But the idea of the Anthropocene is that we've entered a new geological epoch, that the Earth has gone into a, a significant new time, and that is defined by a new geological force, which is the force of human beings changing the planet. And, you know, as, as you and I have discussed in the past and, and other people, and including myself and many other people written about, there's plenty of evidence for that. If you just look at the, you know, quantitatively what human beings are doing to the planet, we're in this new time where we've altered the carbon cycle and the water cycle and, you know, changed the nature of the surface of the planet and the chemistry of the oceans and the chemistry of the atmosphere in so many ways. It's undeniable there's something new happening on the planet. So we can give that force a name and give that time a name and call it the Anthropocene. So that's the idea that we've entered a new epoch that's being called the Anthropocene. And that that's controversial for a number of reasons that we've talked about and we could talk about some more. But the reason why I propose that maybe, in fact, it's something more significant, and in fact, not just a new epoch, but a new eon, which I call the Sapiozoic. The reason I proposed that is because I think that if you look at the nature of the changes between different epochs in the past, there's sort of these random changes in the Earth where, you know, there'll be uh, the climate will change for some reason and there'll, there'll be sea level rise or sea level fall or there'll be, you know, an episode of volcanism or, you know, something, or there'll be a mass extinction. Something will happen and change the planet. And the, in the long run, these are fluctuations that come and go. But when you go over to the left of the chart, these eons, there's only been, well, there's only been four so far. 
And each of the eons represents a huge change in the nature of the planet, a sort of irreversible change. And they all have to do with a changing relationship between life and the planet. So there's only four. So let me say what they are. The first one we call the Hadean, and it means it's when life was hell. And that ended about 4 billion years ago with the origin of life, more or less. And then that began a time that we call the Archean, which is the first time that Earth was occupied. And that lasted till about two and a half billion years ago. And the Archean ended really kind of with the rise of oxygen, when life changed the chemistry of the planet. And that began a time that we call the Proterozoic, which lasted until about 500 million years ago, when we supposedly entered the eon that we are now in, which is called the Phanerozoic. And the Phanerozoic is when life got complex and made plants and animals. So for roughly about five and a half billion years, we've been in the Phanerozoic, and that's when life got you know more interesting and complex. And that's all she wrote. Those are all the eons that are that you'll find in the standard geological column: the Hadean, the Archean, the Proterozoic, and now the Phanerozoic. But what I've suggested is that one way to think about the Anthropocene is that just as all those other transitions I just mentioned were massive changes in the relationship between life and the planet, you could look at the Anthropocene that way. In other words, if you ask what's really new and different about this time, this transition that's happening to Earth now, in my view, it's because it's cognitive processes that are changing the planet. Cognitive processes have become planetary processes. We are, it's not just that we're another species changing the planet. That's happened before. It's not just that we're another species causing a mass extinction. That's happened before. But we're the, this is the first time that it, there's been a new geological force that's aware of its own existence. We're the species changing the planet and going, oh, wow, look at that. We're changing the planet. <laughs> maybe we shouldn't, or maybe we should actually find a way to integrate our activities gracefully with the planet. No other planet changer has had that choice that we have now to actually think about how we want to change the planet. So I maintain that this is then another major transition, potentially, in the relationship between life and the planet. In which case, it would not just be an epoch, it would actually be a new eon, it would be the fifth eon of Earth history, and I call it the Sapiozoic, you know, sort of aspirationally, that means the time of wisdom. And the thing is, it will only be an eon if it really is the time of wisdom, because it, it, and eons last a long time. Is this time of, of humans influencing the planet going to last a long time or short time. So far, it's been ridiculously short geologically. But if we can imagine achieving a sustainable, stable state where we use our knowledge of planetary processes and we use our observations of how we're interacting with the planet to choose those interactions in a way that, that are sustainable, then that could potentially be a very long-lived phase of Earth history. And so it could potentially be an eon. So the Sapiozoic is something I would say that, that hasn't happened yet, but it's, it's an aspirational way to think of what we're doing. We, it's, it's sort of a goal. It's like, okay, if we're going to be a conscious part of the earth and aware of what we're doing, let's choose to uh, behave in such a way that is not self-limiting, but in fact is stable and sustainable. And if we achieve that, then I would maintain we've entered the new eon that I call the Sapiozoic. That's all super helpful. Thank you, David. I wonder how neatly it actually does break down along these optimistic or pessimistic lines because the uh, Anthropocene is typically, there's a the part of it that has a, a, a PR side where it's saying like humans are now in control. They're not doing a good job. They're destroying everything. We have to change our behavior. And so some of the criticism of uh, the Anthropocene as a geological uh, notation of time is that uh, Peter Brandon states this in Have We Earned the Anthropocene? 
we would not probably make it into the fossil record because human civilization is so, so brief, especially when you take deep time into comparison. So if people think that an uh, epic is already too grandiose for human involvement, they almost certainly would think the same for an eon. But I suppose you're saying this is something that we live up to. We have to earn it. We don't just uh, get our own eon if we kill ourselves off very quickly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's an interesting question whether humans have made it into the fossil record already. I would maintain we have, that there are things we've already done to the planet that um, will be recognizable and detectable millions of years from now. But I think the real important point about the Anthropocene is just simply that the processes of change on the planet are indisputably different from what they were a few thousand years ago before we ramped up our uh, industrial activities. And, you know, we can argue about when the Anthropocene actually started, but there's no good argument, really, that the functioning of the planet is not radically changed by human activities right now. Again, quantitatively, if just one example, the amount of water currently behind dams in reservoirs and stored in, in human-built structures is now five times or six times the amount of water left in freely flowing rivers and streams. So that, that's a huge perturbation to the water cycle. And you can go through and look at, you know, the carbon cycle and all these other, you know, there's something undeniably, there's this massive change in the functioning of our planet. And if we give that collection of of processes a name and connect them with the, the the force that that is causing all that that's that's human activities and so that i think that's the the basis for the anthropocene it's not necessarily a belief that we're going to be around a long time it's just looking at the functioning of the planet and how it's changed and giving a name to that i mean there's no minimum time scale that qualifies something from being an epoch so I think that that argument that, oh, we haven't been around long, so we haven't earned epoch status, that just doesn't make sense to me. But the more interesting thing for me, people argue about when the Anthropocene started, which, you know, is kind of interesting, but it's even more interesting to talk about, well, when is it going to end? Or is it going to end? Or what does that look like? And uh, to me, it's intriguing to imagine at least, you know, and, and this is partly my thinking as an astrobiologist, because I imagine, okay, here's a new kind of planetary process, uh, which is thinking, cognitive processes, technology, changing a planet. And as an astrobiologist, I want to say, well, this isn't something that necessarily just happens here. Can one imagine that this is a kind of change that planets go through? Some planets that evolve life and where conditions are right, so life becomes complex and develops cognitive processes, is this transition to where a species is fundamentally changing the planet through technology, is that something that can happen to planets in the universe? And if it can, then is it possible that it's something that can last? Not that it's necessarily going to last here, but one can easily conceive of technology not just being something that's self-limiting and self-threatening, but something that enables a new kind of long-term survival that's never been enabled before. Because now, you know, you can stop those asteroids. You can prevent the next mass extinction. You know, if you, if you sort of get a handle on your own behavior, one can at least imagine an, a state where technology and technological civilization becomes a very stable, long-lived phenomenon. And being able to imagine that makes one realize that, well, that's actually a better idea than just self-extinction. So let's try to figure out what that would look like. And then when you start to imagine survival on the long time scales that that could enable, that's when I go beyond just thinking of an epoch and, and my imagination wants to leap to saying, okay, so are there planets out there that have made this, this transition to you know, self-sustaining, self-aware, stable technological planetary civilizations? And if there are, they would have undergone a transition to a new type of planetary eon, which I, again, call the Sapiozoic. And, and I deliberately, I like that term also because it doesn't refer to us. It doesn't have anthropo in it. It's not saying humans. It's just saying why self-aware life 
interacting with the planet over the long term. And so it could be some other species on some other planet, or it could be some other species on Earth. If it's not us, maybe someone else in a few million years will will start a sapiozoic eon. So it's 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 a look at that phenomenon that's a little less attached to imagining that it has to be humans that achieves that. Wow. If this is your first time listening, if you can hear me chuckling, it's because I think that these ideas are very important and very interesting and also underrepresented in environmental spaces, which could use this kind of perspective. I think it really, it really snaps me out of how I think about things on a regular basis. And I also find it inspirational too. It's something for humans to really aspire to. And David, career-wise, you're not just content to redefine stratigraphy and geological units of time. You're also proposing an idea called the Terra Sapien, which is, we can't just be Homo sapiens anymore. Now you're, uh, there, there's something more to it. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> I mean, it, it's similar to the idea of the Sapiozoic. It's saying, what role can we imagine for ourselves on the planet? I think we do get caught up in the problems we have at present. And I you know, certainly have no intention of minimizing them. We've got some huge challenges on this planet as far as managing ourselves well as a global civilization and having an energy supply that doesn't wreak havoc on our climate. And those are very real problems. But I think it's important to not just think about what we're trying to avoid. We know what we're trying to avoid. We're trying to avoid really dangerous climate change and, you know, sea level rise and collapse of uh, agriculture and, you know, climate refugees, all this stuff we know. And it's important to talk about that. But it's also important to think about what we're seeking, not just what kind of future we want to avoid, but what kind of future do we want to create? You know, there, I guess there's a saying, without a vision, the people will perish, right? So we need more than just fears and regrets and things we're trying to avoid. We need an image of, of the kind of world we can imagine creating. And to me, that's the value of Terra Sapiens which again means wise earth. It's, you know, the, the thought that we could use our scientific knowledge and our growing knowledge of self and our, our growing knowledge of how planets work, including our own planet, to create a truly sustainable global civilization. Um, you know, obviously, we're, there's going to be some growing pains between here and there. But personally, I do think it's possible. And Terra Sapiens is, is sort of the, again, the aspirational name I give to that because after all, sapiens, I mean, when uh, when Linnaeus named us homo sapiens, that means wise apes. And maybe, you know, maybe he was being a little aspirational or, or giving us too much credit. But I think we owe it to ourselves to imagine the role that we want to play on this planet if we're going to be able to do a good job at getting beyond um, the, the behavior that we don't want to continue uh, exhibiting on this planet. I think you did a very nice job here in explaining some of these basics, but I do have one question that haunted Peter and I on the episode we already did, which is how bad is it that I'm switching between uh, Anthropocene and Anthropocene and <laughs> Epic and Epoch? And I don't know what to say, man. I feel like I'm all, it's I know, whoever I talk to about this, they always say it the opposite of me. And then I'm like, what do I do now? It's even worse because uh, my uh, British colleagues say um, Anthropocene. So it's, yeah, is it Anthropocene? Oh, no, they, they say Anthropocene <laughs> or Anthropocene. You know, honestly, to me, of all the different debates about the, the Anthropocene, uh, the one about how to pronounce it is the one that I, I um, care least about. <laughs> so <laughs> I think it's, you know, we all know what each other means if we uh, pronounce it differently. So I, I just don't have a strong opinion on that. I can't help you. <laughs> uh, well, maybe next time. Well, great. Thanks so much for being here, David. If someone wanted to learn more about this, what do you think is a good place for them to start and follow your work and all of that? Well, I, I think most directly applicable to the conversation we've been having today, I would recommend uh, my book, Earth in Human Hands, which really is a book length discourse on the topics we've been raising today. So yeah, I would start there. I think that's a great, great place to do so. I love this book. I think it's great. I think it's due for every so often, David, I have to just like poke through it once again. Well, thank um, you. I really appreciate the uh, the positive feedback. 
Yeah, I feel like we overdo it with you sometimes. We're just we're just big fans. Hope <laughs> you hope you don't mind. We get too excited uh, talking about these ideas. Believe me, I don't mind. It's really nice to get the uh, get the feel. Like I said, writing is a solitary uh, experience, and you start uh, you, you kind of wondering if uh, you've completely lost your mind. And then so when you get it out there and people respond to it, it feels really good. <laughs> That's great. I'm happy to hear it. And you're also on Twitter. Dr. Funky Spoon. Yeah, Dr. Funky Spoon on Twitter. Uh, I've been starting to do. Also, if you got kids uh, and um, your um, kids are are home right now um, because of social distancing, I've been starting to do a Wednesday afternoon kids um, science show on Facebook Live called the the Funky Science Story Hour. So you can, you can go on Facebook and just uh, look for Funky Science Story Hour. <laughs> that sounds very fun. Uh, one last thing, David, if I wanted to do a show on, uh, what is it called? Abiogenesis. That's how you say it, right? Just like, like life emerging ex nihilo and beginning to exist on the planet. If that's even the right way to see it, you think you could, uh, you could help me with a good show on that. Is that, is that your beat? Sure. Yeah. That's, uh, that's definitely something astrobiologists talk about. Yep. All right. Well, maybe that is something to look forward to in the future. That sounds like I have to do a lot of research to do a halfway decent job on it. But thank you so much for listening. Again, if you want to join the, the Nori Book Club, you can go to patreon.com slash Nori Podcast with an S, podcast plural. Uh, rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher. Tell your friends. Hope you enjoyed this. I always do. And uh, thanks so much for listening. Well, thank you so much for listening. If you like the show, please rate and review it in Apple Podcasts and or Stitcher. It really helps us a lot to get this content to a wider audience. If you think what we're doing is useful, interesting, fun, hopefully all three, we'd certainly appreciate your rating and review. You can keep up with Nori at Nori.com where there is a newsletter. That's Nori.com slash subscribe. There's podcast. There's a whole bunch else. Or you can send us an email at podcast at Nori.com. We are also now on Patreon at patreon.com slash Nori Podcasts if you'd like more content, engagement, and community. And thank you so much for your support.